It's Monday the 10th of November and we're back to talk all things THFC and a North London derby to make you proud. This is your eSpurs podcast. Welcome to the podcast, ladies and gents. Don't forget, we want you guys to get involved in the show. So if you like what you hear on the show tonight, there's multiple ways to get in touch and stay in touch with all things eSpurs. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter at e underscore Spurs. Or if you're more of a, a Facebook person, get on there and follow us eSpurs page or one word. And new for this season, you can now follow us on both Google Plus and YouTube. All of the podcasts go up on YouTube. So give us a subscribe on there for all links to eSpurs platforms, just check out our website. The address for that is www.eSpurs.blogspot.co.uk. Tonight we'll be looking back at a performance which really deserved a victory on Sunday at the library. We'll be asking you via our social media, was it a good point or two points dropped? And we'll be discussing the rise of one of our most exciting prospects in a long time. I'm sure we'll all agree one Delhi Alley. Before we start talking Spurs, you know the drill by now, guys. It's time to give you out there a chance to do some listening and get those thinking caps on. The mystery voice on our last episode was Chris Waddle, so if you got that right, well done to you. You're about to hear a clip of a former Spur with just one problem. We've disguised his voice. So see if you can work out who the mystery Spur is this week, and then we'll tell you how you can get involved. Here's the clip. Over the years, we've, we've not done as well as we should have done because each era has been full of really exciting players, all the way back to before 1966. Yeah. And, uh, it's knitting it together. Isn't it's it? knit, well, it's, it's the individuals, that, you know, yeah. instead of saying, well, I'm, I want to be part of this team, I want to be the star of the team. So then that, that, that's sort of away from you can't win a game on your own. So that's the Mystery Spur for this week. All you have to do is send in your answer via our Twitter or Facebook pages. If you're sending your answer on Twitter, just add the hashtag eSpursVoice before the answer and we'll read correct entries on next week's show. As for this week, I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the two Spurs fanatics out there who very much uh, enjoyed the North London derby on Sunday. It's Jason and Ricky. How are you doing, fellas? Very good, thanks. And you? Very, very good, especially after Sundays. We've been talking about off air. Ricky, how are you doing, fella? I'm very well, thanks, Andy. Very well, and yourself? Yep, absolutely. Ready to go, and it's nice. Even though it wasn't a win, it, it almost feels like a, a win, doesn't it, in, in the uh, North London derby? And we'll be coming on to that right now. Let's look at the, the game, lads. Let's get straight into the action. As I say, it was one to make you proud. Let's come to. Let's go to Jason first of all over in Thailand. Jason, it was a it was a great performance. As I say, it wasn't a victory, but it felt like one very much, didn't it? Well, I, th- I thought for for probably sixty minutes of the game, we were the we were the dominant side. I thought they started first fifteen twenty minutes probably better than we did, and and they finished obviously that bit stronger. But for for the for the sixty sixty five minutes in between, it was certainly the best we've been at the Emirates. I think we played better there for the overall than we did when we when we won the game there, uh, what two or three years ago, uh, and I think you know. It was a much better performance than we we thought we'd get there as well. And and Jason, just once again, another standout performance from our midfield, Ali and Dyer in there. Bearing in mind their age, just how impressive was the performance from these guys in a North London derby on Sunday? Well, I think we've seen week in, week out, Dyer has just come on leaps and bounds in that role. And, and it was just a continuation of the effort and set they both peaked incredibly well but Ali his performance considering the the age and where he was in what League One well it was just 12 games ago isn't it that's the thing in 12 Premier League games ago he was in League One and to come to come as he has to play at the Emirates with so uh, so much confidence in his game and being so dominating is, is exceptional it really is it's very um, encouraging isn't it when you see them in there just hope that two years down the line we don't fall into the usual trap of, of letting them go you know I'd love to see them um, build a future at Spurs and I think all of the the, the the sentiment and the words we're getting out of the camp sounds as if they want to do that doesn't it we saw some interviews during the during the weekend of players saying they want to be at Spurs for a long time and it's fantastic to see and I just hope we, we build on it and build a future with some of these guys Deli Alley. some of the pictures some of the pictures as well of Dyer 
looking at Giroud on the floor and looking at <laughs> Alexis Sanchez on it, just like, come on, get yourself up. Fantastic. We just love those pictures, aren't they? Fantastic Absolutely, picks. fantastic. And, and, you know, even more inspiring and, and um, encouraging when you, when, as I say, you think about the age of these guys, you know, they're, they're barely out of their teens. Um, first North London derby for, for Deli Alley. Um, and Dyer's very young himself, and, and they're playing as if they, they care. And I think last season, we all knew things were on the up. We all knew things were... Uh, we knew it was a building process, but the argument that was levelled at some of the players sometimes was that they, they didn't look as if they cared. Well, this season, I don't think anyone can suggest that about any of them. Um, and about any of them, no. The, the next guy we're going to come on to being the prime example of that, Ricky, Eric Lamella... <laughs> I, I, I struggle to find any comparison in terms of a transformation of a player in, in, in recent years. Sunday, a revelation again. There's just one word I can use to describe him, and that's relentless, because that was his game Sunday, just relentless in his play, relentless in his closing down, even on the ball. You know, some of the skill the, the lad has got is superb. You know, sometimes doesn't always know when to use it at certain times, but that will come. But um, the work rate he's providing, you know, he was bought for his skill there's no doubt about that but there's another side to his game which Pochettino has evolved and that's very much this pressing game his defensive capabilities now have gone up in such an estimation it's beyond belief really how the how he's playing and he is proving to be undroppable now I don't see how you can take him out the side he's been absolutely superb and um, long may it continue yeah absolutely I saw a stat uh, a little earlier on that suggested he made the second most tackles in the game, which just goes to show that he, he puts a shift in, you know, and he was everywhere on Sunday, wasn't he? We're speaking off air there, Jason, about the, you know, hearts in mouth moment when it almost as if looked as if we was going to go down to 10 men, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, his work ethic was was astonishing on the day. And I think he's, he's as, as well as changing the perception of the price tag, I think he's changing the perception that, we, we, a lot of people, I think, thought we'd bought a, a tricky winger, mm. and we're suddenly. And, and I think, you know, probably for the first first period of his Spurs life, we were judging him as being a tricky winger and comparing him to to a Lennon. Oh, he hasn't quite got the pace, and he doesn't take people on one on one. And I think gradually now we're starting to see probably the, the player that we did buy, uh, and that he isn't actually just a tricky winger. He, he, I mean, he's, he's not really a winger at all, is he? But the defensive display that he put in was was exceptional. But certainly when he charged into Peter Cech, what, 30 seconds after being booked, I think we all thought, Potch, please get that number 11 up. <laughs> and it was a shame because the game definitely changed when he went off because Son just wasn't wasn't able to replicate that, that work ethic that Lamella put in. Yeah, he's not, not quite that type of player, is he? That, that Well, you certainly haven't seen that of him so far, that sort of... Tack, the, the player that tackles back that Lamella has been this season. But, I mean, just going back to the revelation that Lamella has been last season, Pochettino stuck with him to his credit. He was criticised by most, including myself, for, for having done so. But he stuck with him. And, I mean, Lamella last season, if he tried to score an own goal, he, he would have missed, wouldn't he? You know, but this season, <laughs> he's he's just been fantastic. He hasn't got the goals this season yet. Does that, Ricky, does that matter that he hasn't scored as many as he might have hoped this season? I mean, personally, Andy, I wouldn't be too concerned because I think if you're looking at his assist stats, he's right up there amongst the top of the league in terms of his assists to play. Um, it's just his overall game now that he's adapting. You know, we do want to see goals from him. And I think this season he has, you know, scored quite a few goals already. You know, we're only in November and he's already scored three or four goals. So, you know, the goals will come as much as, you know, the pattern of play. But he is undroppable at the moment. There's no one you can suggest that you'd want to bring in ahead of him. You know, for me personally, it's been an absolute transformation of a player. And at the moment, he's worth every penny. And let's hope he continues to play the way he is at the moment for the rest of the season. Absolutely. It's lovely to see Arsene Wenger getting, you know, frustrated again on the uh, sidelines, wasn't it, on on Sunday? Nothing better than the sight of Arsene Wenger throwing his coat down or <laughs> throwing a wobbly. Absolutely brilliant. And, and Jason, one man who's certainly back in form again is Harry Kane. Yeah, and it's it's great to see, isn't it? And he, he is so important to us because with just that one striker, we all know it, he has to stay in form and more importantly, he has to stay fit. But the goal that he scored was was just was a great bit of movement. And from the moment he went to him, you just you couldn't see him missing, could you? He just opened his body up and slid it in the corner against a, a really good goalkeeper as well. It gave Czech no chance at all. And 
you know, his, his form since that Bournemouth game, and we perhaps got a little bit lucky down there with the with the goals that he scored. You know, a penalty and a cup and, a, and an easy rebound. But since then, we've, we've started to see the cane from last year. Even the Villa goal Monday night, the Anderlecht goal, they were they were goals that Kane was scoring last year, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. It's lovely, lovely to see crisp okay. finishes. You know, really confident crisp finishes. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, I mean, sometimes Jason, it takes that bit of luck, doesn't it? I think even the the best strikers will tell you they go through rough stages and they need that blade of grass to go their way or you know that shot to to bounce in off the post sometimes. Well, I kind of think it was it's more important for us that he did have a bad spell because everything just went so well for him last year. Even the England debut was scored in what eighty seconds of his debut that you think right, how will he respond when you do it? Like all strikers do, how will you respond when you go? eight, nine games without a goal and will you have the confidence to come back from that? And I think we're we're seeing the answer now and, you know, if he goes another six without a goal, you, you don't think... It's certainly not a one-season wonder, that's for sure. No, no, absolutely. And those who suggested that would certainly be... Um eating some humble pie at the moment and and it's great to see because he's our talisman isn't he he's our you would think future captain he's Spurs through and through he's one of our own you know and it's it's lovely (laughs) to see Ricky in terms of the defence although we conceded on on Sunday another great performance from the two centre-backs especially another one who stuck out for me and had a good game another one that's been criticised in the past was Kyle Walker but on Sunday he, he had a great game yeah I have to agree Andy I think Walker this season you know you can't Again, the own goal against um, Manchester United in the first opening game of the season, that was very, very unlucky. I think he's been a consistent 7 out of 10 performer all season, if I'm being really honest with you. I think he's played exceptionally well. Um, I think having Toby in the defence has you know, definitely strengthened that back line now. But Togan looks like a very, very good defender alongside him. And that's because he's got a partner playing next to him that he trusts at the end of the day. And um, Danny Rose back in at left back, you know, you have to say... Um, we've got a very, very strong defence and with Dyer protecting that back line, you know, Spurs look a very, very disciplined side and one that won't concede too many goals because you've got Dyer there in front of that back line and he's so defensively minded, which then allows Ali to have that freedom to express himself in attack. So all in all, Walker, very, very impressive. But so far, as a back four and Dyer inclusive, it's a very, very strong Tottenham defence. It certainly is. I thought I actually thought up until their goal we was going to hold out. I know we was coming under pressure from from them, and they clipped the bar, didn't they? And a few shots over. And Jason, I mean, I've run out of words to describe this guy, but Larice, I mean, one of the saves he, he made especially sticks in my mind. But I mean, it's so good, isn't it, to have that class at the back there behind the centre backs? Yeah, I think we all we all know just what a good goalkeeper he is. Although, if I'm being highly critical of Hugo. I think he could have done better with the goal. He'll, he'll still look at that and think, I got done on my near post with a, with not really a clean strike, was it? It was kind of healed into the ground and maybe misjudged the bounce of it or something. And it, it kind of squirmed in and that's, that left a bitter taste because you, you kind of thought, oh, of all the goals we were going to concede to, yeah. you thought it was, it was quite a soft goal. You know, if, if, if somebody like Sanchez lashes one in from 20 yards, as he's capable of, you think, right, there's not a lot you can do about that. But you just thought the goal when it finally came was was a was a scruffy one. And, and we have to, in in all of it anyway, also mention the fact that Giroud did have two or three really good chances to score. And, and perhaps if, if the defence looks has looked as though it's got any weak point, it may well be the ball that's in the air where we don't, look as dominant in the air as we do defending on the ground. Yeah, and I think the point was made, wasn't it, on Sunday that, we, you know, two centre-backs, maybe not their strongest in the air, maybe better when the ball's on the floor. Um, having said that, I think they defended really well. Another thing I was pleased with was some, some of our set pieces, I think, improved on Sunday. Ericsson, um, certainly, I mean, he's always good with, with corners and, and free kicks, but Sometimes you, you with Spurs, you, you sometimes wonder if they, they actually practice some of the set pieces. But it, it, on Sunday, it was it was a lot better, I think. Well, um, well, I think I saw a stat going into the game that we'd scored more goals from set pieces in the league than any team this year, which was a surprise. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, those certainly help. And it goes back to Pochettino. And I'm sure there are going to be some people out there thinking that I've been on something, you know, with, with Pochettino. Because I've, I've got to say... <laughs> I know there's been a few comments on social media about my criticism of Pochettino over previous weeks. And um, most of those were based based on the style of football, which 
wasn't my my um, my bag. wasn't the, the style of football I enjoy watching. However, the results were coming. On Sunday, I started to to change my my thinking towards Pochettino. I actually, you know, any manager that can put a side out that plays like that, who is building clearly a young, um, strong side. They're not just young and, and in there for the sake of being young players. They're they're strong players, aren't they? So I'm sure this will surprise some, but I, I'm actually starting to to come around to the guy. Um, but that, as I say, was based on the style of football. I was, you know, there was, especially the Europa games on a Thursday, you know, was 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 a hard watch. But I think this season, any manager who can go 11, what is it, 11, 12 unbeaten now this season, there's got to be something special going on there, isn't there? And um... I have to say, on your point there, Andy, with Pochettino, I think the issue is what a lot of fans um, don't see is the squad that he inherited and expected straight away for the same brand of football yeah. to be uh, the case at Southampton. And the issue he had at Spurs is that he just didn't have those players that could adhere to that high-pressing game. And he's changed the squad, and you've seen he's got rid of a lot of Deadwood over the summer, and he made it plainly clear to the board which players he wanted to keep, which players he wanted to sell, and which players he wanted to bring in. And I think now you are seeing a change in the way Spurs are playing. It is a very, very high-pressing game. Um, evident to the display against Arsenal, which they just simply could not handle on Sunday. And I think now a majority of fans are warming to the manager because he does seem to have a squad now that very much cares for the club. And I think for the first time since, I would say, the Red Nap era, Tottenham fans feel connected again with the players and with the manager. And it's a great feeling. I just hope we give him the time because there's no guarantee that we're going to get into the, to the top four this season. There's no guarantee that we are going to win a trophy, but there's no doubt at all. Looking at the team, 11 games unbeaten, three points off a Champions League spot, five points off the top of the Premier League in November. We are going in the right direction. Spot on. And, and my only concern with it all, once again, is that you know, you've got this good manager in place now, which, which we have. Um, you've got great, young players there not just good young players but players that you would think will go on to become internationals for years to come real real exciting players in there Jason my main concern is that our chairman who some like some are not too keen on in a couple of years doesn't get itchy fingers and, and is tempted to, to sell because then surely you're you're back at square one again well that's always going to be the problem I think the the itchy fingers I'm not so worried about with the likes of Kane. I think more the problem will still be come the end of the season that an Ericsson or a, or a Hugo will then think, if we haven't got in that top four, I still think that's the danger. I don't think it's a danger with Kane. I don't think it will be a danger with, with say, a Deli Alley or a Alderweireld or people like that because they've, they've, they're they new to the club and they've, in, in Ali's and Alderweireld's case, only the one year. But it, it is an Ericsson that's been there then three years and maybe, you know, they, they talk about offering him a contract, but if he doesn't sign it and there's two years left on the contract, then that's, I think, a point when Levy gets accused sometimes of, of having a trigger finger. But he thinks, well, I can't afford to let a, a, a £35 million player leave in a year's time for £12 million. Mm. And if he's not going to sign a contract this year, he's probably not going to sign one. And, you know, I think that there's a little bit of that that has to come into it. But the key is, for sure, for us to develop as a side, we need to keep that side together. We really do. Yeah, and all of the, as I say, all of the, the words that come out of the camp sound, sound extremely promising in terms of the future. They want to be at Spurs for years to come. Harry Kane said on a number of occasions, you know, he wants to stay at Spurs and become a, a Spurs legend. And there's there's nothing better than, than to hear that, is there, from, from one of your, your key players. In terms of, we've just spoken, lads, about the Champions League and, Earlier on in the season on the podcast, we said, look, you know, it's not realistic this season, the Champions League. We're still a new side, two seasons in under the manager. Are we starting, Ricky, now to change our thinking on Champions League? Has it now become realistic? Well, I'll tell you what the the thing is now, Andy, with Chelsea's form. I mean, I keep saying, I kept saying every week for the last six, seven weeks, you know, Chelsea, they can't be as bad as this. They will pick up points. We're now 10 points clear of Chelsea. And Chelsea are always, obviously one of the favourites to not only make the top four, but win the league. And the fact of the matter is, because they are so far behind, and you're looking at Spurs now, that we're a third through the season. We've only lost once to an own goal. Um, you know, we're 10 points clear of them. So you've got to say, you know, there's every chance this season um, that we can make that Champions League. And I think the key will be in January, if we are still amongst the clutch of clubs at the top, can we go out and buy the Berahino or buy another striker to complement Kane um, 
so we can push on because I think that's we're not far away. You look at the squads on paper, Spurs, once we've got our best team out, can be anyone. That's a given fact. So it's now a case of getting to January, seeing where we are, assessing our options. Um, but yeah, I think everything's to play for for Spurs. I'll tell you what, just talking about the tran- January transfer windows you do there, I've, I've said this many, many times, but there's one player that I think if we go out and get this player, we're, we're top four, spot on, no, no doubt about it, and that's Lukaku. I don't think they'd sell to you know to anyone at the moment, um, and it certainly costs a lot of money, which it's debatable whether or not we pay that. But I think you bring, Jason, would you agree on that? You bring a player like Lukaku in and the sky's the limit. Well, I'm not as big a sold on Lukaku as, as a lot of people. I always thought Benteke was probably better than Lukaku. Um, and Lukaku, I, I just think that, I can't see why Lukaku would go to Tottenham because he'd think it's not an immediate big step up. I think his next step will be a, a genuine Champions League club. And I think for the money it would cost us, mm. it's going to cost you what? I mean, Everton paid, what, £28 million for him. I can't see them selling him for less than that. And as they demonstrated over John Stones in the summer... You know, you could throw 35 million at them and they might still say, sorry, that's not enough for us, particularly in the middle of a season when they themselves. So I, that one I can't see. I still think there's probably more chance of signing Berahino if if we still want Berahino in January. But as Ricky says, for sure, we have to bring that strike. If we are to push for a top four place, we have to bring that striker in because you can't ask Kane to do it week in, week out and expect him to stay in form. And... You know, I mean, we're lucky that he doesn't pick up injuries yet. But if he missed, if if he was out for uh, six weeks, that would be a big, big difference to us. It really would. Whilst we've only lost one, if we're honest with ourselves, we've actually only won five of the 12. Mm. And so, you know, it is, for me, we're, we're, we're definitely going in the right direction. We're on the right path, but there's still quite a path to climb. And that Chelsea game in two weeks' time, I think they've got Norwich at home next when we've got West Ham, you could surely Chelsea will beat Norwich at home. I mean, they must beat Norwich at home. Uh, did you watch a West Ham game? could be a really <laughs> tricky game for us, and then it's that Chelsea game. So, you know, I, I think if 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 we certainly get the win against West Ham and then beat Chelsea, then I think they're definitely then whether they're out the equation for fourth. But I think you'd say, well, I can't see them finishing above Spurs now because the gap would then be equivalent to thirteen points, and that's that's a hell of a gap to change. But that, that Chelsea game is key. If they were to win at White Hart Lane and we drop against West Ham, I think, you know, the end of this November month, we'll have a much better idea. It's certainly crucial, isn't it? And they often say, don't they, you know, you can't really look at the league table until after Christmas. No. And you look at West Ham's form and they've gone to all the, the better sides and won, and won well at those games. And then they've struggled with the, the games that you think they should be able to win. But there will still be a threat at White Hart Lane for sure. I mean, let's not make any doubt about it. For West Ham fans, this is their cup final, you know, and Bilic will be drilled. You know, he knows how big this fixture is. Away at Spurs, you know, they've had a fantastic away record in terms of, you know, going away and winning at the big clubs. Um, They obviously failed to beat Watford away. So that's something for Spurs to kind of look into. They're going to be about Payet, who's arguably West Ham's best player. He's out for three months now. Um, Obviously, we're going to be without Lamella. So we're losing him. But in that instance obviously Son will probably come back into the starting lineup. So it's a very, very big game in a couple of weeks and um I just can't wait for it. I just hope the boys from our end are gonna be as prepared as what the West Ham lads are because there's no doubt about it. Billich will have those players raring for that game and we've got to be exactly the same in terms of attitude and work rate because if we do put the performance in that we put against Arsenal, West Ham won't stand a chance. They will not stand a chance against us. It's, it's... It was also Bilic that last year did for us in the Europa when, when of course, Bajiktas came to White Hart Lane. And even though I think on the night it was 1-1 with a late penalty, they were actually by far the better side on the night. Mm. And then they beat us in Turkey as well. And that was with Bilic in charge. So, you know, he himself will think, I fancy myself against Pochettino Spurs. Having said that, I mean, their main man this season has been Pyatt, hasn't it? I mean, if you... If you asked any West Ham fan, he's been an absolute revelation there. So it's a huge blow, Jason, that he's out this season, for the game. It's a big blow that he's out. But my one worry is and a little bit going back to the Giroud chances. Andy Carroll has bullied us in the past. As, as much as a donkey as I think he is, 
I mean, the goal against Chelsea that he scored the other day shows that if they get the delivery to him in the box right, he will cause us problems. And certainly if he'd have had the chances that Giroud had all on his head, you think he would have probably scored. And he scored, he scored three or four against us in the past, hasn't he? There was the game, I think, at, at West Ham, was it two years ago, when, when that was the game, wasn't it, that Cabal got sent off in. But he bullied us that day by, by a long way. And we just can't allow that, that bullying to happen again. Yeah, it's going to be going to be interesting to see. Certainly, a crucial crucial November. We asked this week on Twitter our, our usual social media question for the podcast, just after the Spurs Arsenal game, what the general feeling of the fans was after the game. Was it one a case of one point gained, or was it two dropped? It very much felt like it, it, it's mixed emotions, isn't it? Really, because it was a great performance, but the Arsenal goal coming so late, it, it then felt as if we dropped the two points. Um, having said that, you could look at it that it's a crucial point in a game away to Arsenal. It's a fantastic point to get. So, so that was our question on the social media this week. Um, just really gauging the feelings of fans as to whether or not they felt it was a point gained or two dropped after the North London derby. Um, first of all, Newfell at Chiba, I hope I pronounced that correctly, says two points dropped. We missed a lot of opportunities and we were better than Arsenal. Um, Alex Dawson says definitely two dropped, although we showed what we can do, which was superb. James O'Dono says two dropped. We need to kill off teams when we're on top. And I think there was a few comments on the day saying similar to that. And that's something the side I'm sure will learn is that we need to start killing off teams when we when we're so dominant as we were on Sunday. Um, Alex Gibbon says two dropped. Frustrating that Spurs can't seem to dominate any team for a full 90 minutes. Would you agree with that, Ricky? I think we have to be honest, just in regards to the Arsenal game in general, if we were to say a couple of years ago, we're going to go to Arsenal, dominate the game in large periods and be disappointed to come over with a point. I mean, I think our attitude would be, well, we've we've moved on as a club. I think the issue we also have with regards to Thursday, uh, with regards to the game on Thursday against Anderlet is that naturally the majority of our team did play that Anderlet game in the North London derby. 60 to 65 minutes in, I know players, everyone says, oh, they can play twice a week, shouldn't be a, an issue. But the fact of the matter is that these players, they do work hard. They do run their, they do run for Pochettino. So I think it's a case of where the players, from a from a fatigue perspective, it may have just have been too much to ask of them that, that last 10, 15 minutes. And the game caught up with us and Arsenal did bring on a couple of fresh legs um, in Gibbs that you know got his goal in the end and worked hard when he came on. Um, but I have to say, I mean, I still think a point against Arsenal was a great result. You know, taking the derby out of it, as a side, Arsenal were uh, been the top of the league on goal difference. To go away to the side top of the league and to get a point, I personally think is a bad result. And it again keeps us, I know it sounds silly, just under the radar, ticking away. And, you know, quietly, quietly, Spurs keep picking up the points, you know, and, we, and we're still we're still up there amongst the bunch. Yeah, absolutely. I tell you what, I felt after that game, it's, considering the the games we've played this season where I've had a bit of a moan and I felt we weren't necessarily playing, you know, fantastic football. After that game, I think I felt more proud than I have of Spurs this season at any time. Um, and, and therefore, it felt as if, although we we dropped the two points at the end, it felt as if it was a point gained. Um, and, and to be honest, I couldn't care less what the result was, if I'm honest, because I was so proud of them and the performance they put in. And I think that's the case for most fans, isn't it? As long as they go out there and put a shift in, put a performance in, um, then then that's really um, what matters. Uh, maybe not in a North London derby where you'd hope, you know, your side get a win. But but there's nothing at all, I don't think, to be to be disappointed about from from Sunday. Absolutely brilliant. Um, just a couple of other, other comments, lads. Alf Love says it was too dropped. If only we had a clinical and prolific goal poacher, things could be so different. To play with Harry, of course. Um, that was a point the lads were making earlier on. Um, Lee Bennett says a draw away to that lot is always a good point, but still a little gutted. It wasn't all three points. And finally, Mr. J. Smith says two points dropped. However, to come away thinking that means we've come a long way in a short space of time. And I think all of us would would echo those sentiments. Um, listen, lads, we've got to move on because time's getting away with us. Great performance on Sunday and let's hope there's more of that to come. I want to move on and, and just talk briefly, if we can, about the, the superstar that we, we spoke about earlier. Superstar in the making. He's getting rave reviews at the moment um, in the England squad. Man of the match on Sunday, won Delhi Alley. Jason, just how good can this guy go on to become? It's, it's frightening how good he, he could be. Um, as Pochettino says, he just has to continue to work as he's currently doing. I mean, 
I, I still sit here and at, at the start of the season, I thought we'll play him in pre-season and this ball show the odd flash here and there. And we saw with the nutmeg, the famous double nutmeg of Modric and Cruz. But you thought he'll probably end up being loaned out to a championship club or a, or a side that's down the, the, the bottom half of the Premier League, say a Norwich or, or someone like that. But the, the, it's to force his way into the side and a side that's playing well within, you know, he's been in since about game six, hasn't he? Mm. I think he's, his maturity and he's, he looks an intelligent footballer. I still go back to the goal at Leicester that he scored, which, which was a simple finish, but he, he just had that look along the line and made sure he didn't run offside. And, and that day you thought, no, there's there's a football brain in the boy, and we just see it every week with him. It's, it's the the goal he scored um, where he took it down on his thigh and put it in the corner the other night against Villa again. He didn't rush it. He looked like he had time on the ball when there were people running towards him. It was just so composed and so mature. That's that's the thing about him. Yeah, he certainly plays beyond you know with a with a brain beyond his years, doesn't he? He's, he's... Fantastic to watch and the passion that he plays with as well. Just a few stats from, from Deli Alley. He's won more tackles than any other teenager in the Premier League this season, 23. So although he's got that attacking side to his game, he, he works back and puts the, puts the shift in. Um, on Sunday, he had 56 touches, ran 11 kilometres, 71 sprints, which was eight more than any other player on the pitch. 27 passes and ironically I don't know if any of you lads out there saw this but in the sun they gave him a rating of five um, <laughs> um uh, any sun readers out there <laughs> it's funny you say that Andy because I picked up on that yesterday I had to drop a tweet to the sun and say can I ask who done this match review because I'm not sure what game they were actually watching no. um it's just absolutely bizarre and I think Lamella was also given a five and I just couldn't believe what I was reading or I mean that pretty much tells you everything you need to know about the sun doesn't it in terms of a a football perspective. Yeah, in terms maybe, of, uh, it, maybe it was a five just because he didn't nutmeg anyone. Well <laughs> maybe that was, the, that was the difference or something. Yeah, I mean, that's how high our expectations are of Deli Ali now, that that performance gets a five. Um, it's, it's cra- maybe the, the uh, correspondent was a gooner at the Emirates. It's um, absolutely unbelievable. But, I mean, he really is coming on, you know, leaps and, and bounds. In terms of England, Ricky, we've all mentioned that for Spurs, we'd love to keep him there for, you know, at White Hart Lane for years. For England, do you think he's going to be key moving forward in future World Cups? Yeah, and that's really my concern, if I'm being honest with you, Andy, that he is going to become um, an England regular at some point. Might not be now, but in the future. And that's where you have to worry in terms of keeping the players' feet on the ground. And also, inevitably, with the England, you know, England call-up is going to attract attention elsewhere. Um, So, for me personally, I think we've just got to enjoy him as long as we have him. But I think what we need to bear in mind is, like you said, in terms of the tackling, he's hardly, you know, a very bulky guy. So if you wait until he muscles up next season, you know, what a player we're going to have on our hands. And I just hope we can keep hold of him. And that obviously means keeping hold of the rest of the squad as well. Um, But yeah, I do feel for England, he will go on to become a regular. He's a phenomenal young talent and one that I just hope we can keep hold of. Absolutely. I'm always frightened of bigging him up too much. You know, it's that, that kind of situation, isn't it? You know, you don't want him to, to big him up too much in case he uh, it, it doesn't work out. But yeah, there's certainly every every sign that he will go on to become a, a fantastic player. And what a great, great signing he is to have. Jason, it was mentioned also on Sunday that key to his progress was the fact that we, we loaned him back to MK Dons last season and we didn't drag him straight into the, the Spurs fold. Do you see that as being important to his, his success? Well, I think it... it, it... It, it certainly hasn't harmed him, has it? I mean, he was able to play week in, week out when perhaps had he come there with with some of the players that we had on the books and trying to get rid of them and still trying to sort ourselves out that he, he wouldn't have had that playing time. And as I said, I, I, my fear was that we would loan him again at the start of this season. Um, so and he enjoyed himself. I think at MK Dons, he was playing in a pressurised situation with them chasing promotion which made more sense than, than perhaps just bringing him over to play cup football for us. And, and, and as with any young player, you know, the more number, the more games they get under their feet, the, the high pressure games they have, even if it is championship or league one, the better it is for all of them. I think we've seen that with, with Carl Walker coming back from loan all those years ago. We had it initially with Townsend, didn't he, when he came back from loan, having had a good spell at QPR. I think we've used the loan system well. Pritchard is perhaps the one shame that we haven't been able to bring him in because of injury, where where he had a really good loan season last year. Yeah, it's, it's a nice problem to have, isn't it? You know, that strength in depth. And just finally on the Deli Alley subject, lads, what must 
Nabil Bentaleb be thinking? You've got a guy in there who was potential captain material last season. You know, again, rave reviews. Now, Ricky, could you see him getting back in the team at the moment? It's just so funny how football works, isn't it? Because when Bentaleb got injured, we were, I mean, we were quite worried. You know, Bentaleb being injured, you know, he was, you know, automatic at first person on the on the team sheet for Spurs in terms of the midfield and now suddenly I mean how can you even look at the prospect of dropping Dembele, Dyer or Ali I mean I mean you just you just can't do it can you I mean you look at it and just think how is he going to get himself back in and I think what will happen with Ben Taleb I think personally he'll have to work his way back in probably via the Europa League because I think what you've seen with Pochettino in terms of the Premier League he likes to keep a consistent team and therefore, there's going to be no chance, in my opinion, that Bentaleb just walks straight back in. It will be a case for him where he'll have to go and prove himself in the Europa League or, like I say, in a season, an injury or two leads to an opportunity. And that's where I think Bentaleb might get his break back in. But um, I'm expecting him to be part of the squad for the West Ham game, but I certainly wouldn't be expecting him to walk back in the side for Dembele or Dyer, in my opinion. Jason, he's also got to get past Mason, hasn't he? Because, you know, Mason's now back in fitness and you'd think probably if Deli Ali was to miss out or Dembele missed out, you'd think that Mason would probably get that place before Ben Taleb as well. So, you know, I think with, Dele, with the Deli Ali scenario, what we have got to bear in mind is he's 19 and he will not play at that level for 38 games in a season. The, 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 the kid will have a, a drop-off of a, where he goes through two or three quiet games and he may need to then come out the side. I, th- I think that's, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to expect him to play at that level in his first season in the Premier League with, with the physical demands and the, the mental demands. Plus then if you start throwing international games in, that, that's a lot to ask of the kid in his first season. So, you know, I think there will be a times when he has a quiet patch, and it's it's just important that we accept that that that's that's a natural thing for a 19-year-old kid to do. It's a lovely, lovely problem to have, and it's um, something that we we you know for years to come, hopefully, we'll be seeing the best of of, of Delhi Alley. Great stuff, um, lads. Finally, on the show, we're going to move on to a subject that that popped up, reared its ugly head last week, which was um, the Andros Townsend situation. Allegedly had a bust up with the fitness coach, Nathan Gardner, after the the Aston Villa game. Ricky, your your thoughts on this one? I think, I mean, to be honest with you, Andy, Pochettino made a fantastic point in his press conference after the incident happened. I think, from what I understand, um, I've read that Townsend's representatives aren't that happy that Pochettino has gone public. But in all honesty, he hasn't said that's the end of the way for the player. Um, he's just said that from his point of view, he's a disciplinarian and therefore, you know, there are rules that are in the squad and can't be broken. However, he made a fantastic quote that I've got here and he said, whenever you sign for Spurs or any or any club, you sign to train, not to play. Only once you impress the manager will you play. And I think that is a fantastic quote because many players just think when they sign for a football club that that guarantees them a starting spot. And that's not the case, especially with Pochettino. He wants to see the players perform well in training to then give him a selection headache for the weekend game. Now, in all honesty with Andros Townsend, for me personally, he's not done enough in a Spurs shirt whenever he has come on to warrant an opportunity. Uh, to start a game and if you want my honest opinion with Townsend I don't think he's good enough to play for Spurs I think personally he needs to go out um, to a club no offence along the lines of a Southampton an Everton a Crystal Palace and play the game week in week out and learn the game because you can't go into every game looking on the wing to to beat a man there's got to be more to your game and that's the issue with Townsend I don't think game craft wise he's he's good enough to adapt his game and that that's what my take is on the situation with him I mean you certainly think he, he probably doesn't fit into Pochettino's system um bearing in mind Pochettino doesn't play the wide game does he so that that straight away puts puts Townsend on the bench Jason do you do you feel any sympathy for for the Townsend and his situation well I, I think you know the, the spat came um how can you put it in in the right way in the sense that you want a player to be frustrated that he's not in the first team. And I'm sure when, when, you know, they made the first two substitutions and then he saw Josh Onuma come on for those last six or seven minutes and he'd, he'd come on the game before and he even came on Sunday, didn't he? And i and I think he probably feels, look, I, I thought I was further up in the hierarchy. And so I understand the frustration to play, but then for his representatives to complain about Pochettino going public, 
I would say it was Townsend that went public by doing it in front of the, the world's media on the pitch while, while all the photographers were there. And if he'd have gone in on the Monday, on the, on the Thursday morning, or what was it, the Tuesday morning, or when it, what was the Villa game, wasn't it? Yeah. So if he'd have gone into Pochettino Tuesday morning and said, look, you know, I'm a bit peeved that Onomar came on and had a normal conversation, the, none of us would have ever known that would happen, would it? So it, he was the one that, that made it public first by doing it in such a public way. But I think, like Ricky says, he's just unfortunately hasn't hasn't really pushed on in his development from when we saw him three years ago. He there's nothing new that he's added to his game and, and that lack of game craft and that lack of football brain has, has showed itself so often. So I think it probably is come January time that I wouldn't even loan him out. I think it's time to say, look, you know, it, it, there's other young players. Pritchard hopefully then starts to get back to fitness and Onimar's come into the squad and we've got other young players to come in and do that job. And Pochettino, you're right, doesn't play with an out-and-out -out winger anyway, which is unfortunately what I think Townsend probably is. So, you know, if somebody comes along with seven, eight million quid, I'd, I'd say, you know, take, take the money and, and, and let the boy go on and have a career somewhere else. Which seems the, the likely option. Which is a shame as a, as a genuine Spurs fan that he is, but... You know, just being a Spurs fan can't be enough for you to play for the club, can it? No, absolutely. It, uh, I mean, in terms of just finally on this one, Jason, would you say that you feel that Pochettino dealt with it in the right way? I think he dealt with it in the way that you have to, in that, you know, you've got to be fair to the rest of the squad. And, and you know, it may well take us back to where we were with, with Aaron Lennon last year and the, the spat that apparently happened with, was it before the Hull game right at the start of last year mm -hmm. when... And I think he, he kind of set the tone then and he, he made it clear to the Lennons, the Kapuas and that, look, you know, if you're not going to tow the line, you're not going to tow the line. There's no place for you here. And he stuck to his guns on all of those. So it's very hard to to flip that backwards and make an exception for someone else. I have to say, lads, that's a great point there by Jason, because the most important thing that a manager has is control of the dressing room. And with Pochettino, we have that. We have a manager now with the squad of players that completely respects him as a person and him as a manager. And most importantly of all, you can see the results are working. So the players are buying into his philosophy. And the reason why we're now seeing an upturn in performances is because the players are buying into it. So if Pochettino was to just simply allow Townsend to get away with his actions after that match, then it goes against everything that he's trying to build. He wants to be the leader of the club. He wants to show and embrace that. And that's why fans are behind him because Everybody can see we've now got a leader in charge of the club that cares about the club. The players care about wearing our shirt and he has to do that. And I don't think he done anything wrong what he said, Pochettino, in bringing it to the public what happened. He said for Townsend that, you know, it doesn't mean to say the player can't work his way back into the squad. He hasn't said he's burnt his bridges, but it's about discipline and it's about learning. And we'll see if Townsend comes back as a player and works his way back into the squad. Personally, for me, I feel his time has come. But um, we said the same thing. I think, you know, Dembele, the rumour was a couple of months ago that Dembele yeah. was about to be shipped off to Napoli. So no players' bridges are burnt until they've left the club. We have to bear that in mind. But um, there's a way about managing players. And I think Pochettino, every player that's come through the door at Spurs, he's managed them correctly. And, you know, we're seeing the, re the results right now in terms of where we are in the league and where we're going. Absolutely. And that the quote that you mentioned just a moment ago, Ricky, the uh, the Pochettino quote, it just suddenly brought, brought to my mind sort of things that, you know, dare I say it, the, the great Bill Nicholson used to say, you know, in terms of when you sign for a club, you, you go out there and you train, you work hard. And then if you deserve your place, you'd get a place in the team. It's the sort of thing he'd say, you know, you go out there and play for the fans. Um, and and great to hear you know i'm not trying to <laughs> for a moment compare the two managers there but it's absolutely the right thing you want to hear coming from your manager so you know another i think as well i think as well with when you're right when you talk about dembele and he came out with a comment didn't he not so long ago when he said it's taken me a year to understand what pochettino wants and you you kind of you can read behind that as if to say that he probably has sat down with pochettino a few times in the right way look why aren't i in the side what do i need to do and that's the way Townsend should have gone about it, not throwing a throwing a, a wobbly on the pitch where the, where the whole media was there. That's the difference, probably. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's hope for, for all all parties um, that, that it works out positively. And, and I'm sure it will. It's, it, just going back to, to what the lad said there a moment ago, it's so important, isn't it, to keep the dressing room. We've seen down the road at Stamford Bridge what, what can happen when you lose uh, the dressing room. And 
it, it's great to see the the way that Pochettino's dealt with the situation. So all 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 positive, and let's end on that positive note, lads. What a great podcast, and um, what a great game to talk about. And let's hope it's a it's a great future for for all of these young stars that we're, we're talking about on the show tonight. And um, don't forget, lads, you can follow us on um, Twitter at e underscore Spurs, um, on Facebook e Spurs page if you want to get involved in the show. And um, the guys you're listening to tonight also have their own social media accounts, which you'll be able to pick up via the e Spurs Twitter account we we send them out regularly when we advertise the show so give them a follow give us a follow let us know your thoughts on the show and uh, and what you thought on on what was said tonight and um, we'll be back after the international break when hopefully harry kane's got a hat trick against spain um, to talk about on the next show and of course we'll be looking at the west ham and chelsea game after that international break other than that guys have a great week and as always from all of us come on you spurs